We have big blow up games. We have key injuries to CMC, Justin Fields, David Montgomery, Lawrence Debo, Jimmy G, Kyron, Ryan Tannehill. And we have some running back usage trends that are changing. So we have a lot to talk about. We're going to start off with the most surprising thing that happened this week. I am sure that so many people watching this video got bounced from their survivor pools to see the 49ers lose to the Cleveland Browns. We'll talk about the Eagles Jets later on. Very surprising as well. But Purdy was very bad in this game. Brock Purdy, 27 passing attempts, 125 passing yards. He had his first interception this season. He only had one passing touchdown. And I know a lot of people here are going to overreact. And a lot of people are going to say, oh my gosh, yeah, Brock Purdy's not him. Guys, it's any given Sunday. Let's really take a look at what happened here. Brock Purdy had a very tough matchup. It wasn't ideal weather. And you had Debo Samuel leaving this game after only playing nine snaps. And Christian McCaffrey only playing about half the game as well. So you remove two of the best weapons that Brock Purdy has. You give him a tough matchup in not great weather, plus the fact that it's any given Sunday. In reality, I'm not going to have too many takeaways. We're going to continue to monitor the Debo Samuel and Christian McCaffrey injuries. Nonetheless, if both these players miss next week, obviously there's a lot to talk about with the running backs between Elijah Mitchell and Jordan Mason. This week, Jordan Mason was the guy whenever you had Christian McCaffrey leaving this offense. Talk about this in a little bit more depth in the running back video tomorrow. So just make sure you are subscribed to the channel. But you would also give a bump up to Brandon Ayuk and George Kittle. If you have no CMC, if you have no Debo Samuel, just because they get a higher target share overall in this respective offense. But with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, I understand George Kittle was bad this week. We know he's going to be an extremely volatile tight end. I mean, honestly, this may be a buy low moment. I mean, very easy to say with Kittle. Okay, he has three touchdowns. We probably look to sell him high. He has zero yards. We probably look to buy him low. He's just going to spike up, give you nothing, spike up, give you nothing. Perfect best ball option, but it's all going to even out in the end. Now, going over to the Cleveland side, y'all know I'm not a Jerome Ford guy. We were saying to sell Jerome Ford high after his Tennessee game. And I will say, it looked great, right? I mean, 84 rushing yards. He had 17 carries. But in my mind, it changes nothing. The reason we were going through and saying to sell Jerome Ford high is because this was going to be a running back by committee and a bad offense. And I don't think Jerome Ford, I don't think Kareem Hunt are particularly talented enough to overcome a running back by committee. It's exactly what we saw today. I mean, Jerome Ford sees about half the snaps here. Kareem Hunt gets a considerable amount of usage. Kareem Hunt actually scores a touchdown. Thank God for our best ball teams. He helped us out in a few spots there. Really, there aren't too many things to discuss. Neither running backs that interesting. PJ Walker was still very bad. Amari Cooper managed to overcome it. Like a, a shout out, Amari. Great job. In reality, nothing's going to be too different going forward. Now, going over to Baltimore, this is a situation where we can say, oh, okay. Um, we can kind of throw it out the window. You had the. Tennessee Titans just not in this game at all. Like, this wasn't even really a football game. It was a London game as well. We know that typically with these London games, a lot of random things are going to happen. Lamar looked decent. Lamar had a considerable amount of rushing yards, which is why you draft Lamar Jackson. One thing that I want to be on the lookout for is it's kind of crazy. I mean, I've heard a million people go through and Talk to us about Keaton Mitchell. Mason, you got to go through and talk about Keaton Mitchell in your waiver wire video. I don't know why I'm hearing this guy's name so often in these live streams. We were told before the game he was active. We were told before the game he was off the eye. I don't know. I mean, I was told he was going to be active. I'm looking at the snap counts here. You have Gus Edwards, 44 snaps. Justice Hill, 27. Keaton Mitchell, zero. So I don't know if this guy was actually active. I, I don't know if y'all are just wasting roster spots holding on to him. I mean, I don't think Keaton Mitchell is intriguing at all because even if he does come out here and turn into the lead back in Baltimore, the man weighs like 100 pounds soaking wet, and it's probably going to be a running back by committee no matter what. Nothing really changes in Baltimore. Going over to Tennessee, it tweeted this out, I mean, I believe after the first quarter. It was like, give me Will Levis, give me Malik Willis, give me legitimately anybody outside of Ryan Tannehill. Ryan Tannehill finishes the game 16 passing attempts, 76 passing yards, and the INT. He has a QBR of 18.3, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Ryan Tannehill does get injured in this game. Ryan Tannehill leaves on a cart. No official news on Tannehill just yet. This will be something that we keep you posted with. But, I mean, almost it doesn't even matter if Malik Willis is the starter here. Because it looks like Malik Willis is not going to be propping up DeAndre Hopkins. 
Hopkins has his five targets. He leads the team in targets for a whopping one reception and 20 receiving yards. But still, at the same time, and not really too excited about what we have in Tennessee. With Derrick Henry, he does go out there, and he has the long wildcat run, and he gets you the rushing touchdown, so he saves himself in fantasy. But he still does have fewer snaps than Taji Spears. Now, going over to Washington, Sam Howell performed well. I, I mean, I'm sorry if I told you to bench Sam Howell, but, I mean, don't blame me after the Chicago game. He had three passing touchdowns off of only 23 passing attempts. Not a ton of yardage totals, but it's just because, I mean, Atlanta was never really in this game. And then Brian Robinson has himself a day. If you're going to be looking at the snaps here, Brian Robinson, 27 snaps in comparison to Antonio Gibson at 20. Obviously, the touches heavily skew for Robinson, where he has 10 carries. He also has two receptions out of this backfield for a total of about 55 yards, but he also gets you the receiving touchdown. And we have crushed back-to-back -back weeks the Brian Robinson more than receiving yards on underdog fantasy. I believe this week it was at about eight and a half. And of course, real quick, ladies and gentlemen, if you have not done so already, make sure you take advantage of what we got you on Underdog. Literally, this never happens. I know I've been annoying you about this, but Underdog hooked you up for our birthday this week. Promo code FLOCK on Underdog Fantasy. You're going to get a 100% deposit match, our updated rest of season fantasy football rankings and tiers. If you are new to Underdog Fantasy, a Dak Prescott special pick -em. More than less than half a total yard tomorrow night. And because it was our birthday last week, Underdog hooked y'all up with a Justin Herbert special pick -em. On top of that, more than less than half a total yard. Only with promo good flock. So please make sure you take advantage. Get that 100% deposit match. Get both special pick -ems. Get our rankings. Super pumped we were able to get y'all that. Link in the live chat description and comment section. But nonetheless, Terry McLaurin does go out there and have 11 targets. Great to see McLaurin dominating with target share. It's crazy as John Dotson is literally just a non-factor here. I mean, Dotson even runs more routes than Curtis Samuel. Dotson at 25 routes compared to Samuel at 19. But at the same time, Samuel scores a touchdown. Really, nobody's that exciting in this offense. You start Brian Robinson as a mid-running back two. You start Terry McLaurin as that low and wide receiver two, high and wide receiver three. I think nobody else is viable. Oh, one other thing. Logan Thomas gave us the head fake. He, he made it seem like he was going to be something against the Chicago Bears. Comes out today, gives you nothing. Now, going over to Atlanta, um, Desmond Ritter has 47 pass attempts. This is not the game that the Atlanta Falcons were planning. Very frustrating to see Bijan Robinson with only 37 rushing yards. Now, with that being said, Bijan's going to do Bijan things, so he's going to save his day regardless. He has the five receptions for 43 receiving yards out of the backfield as well. Dominates the snaps, 64 snaps, comparison to Tyler Algier at 23. Was very interesting. Drake London excels however going forward do we expect that to be the case i would say probably not the reason being is desmond ritter had 47 pass attempts in this game this atlanta falcons coaching staff when they go to bed at night when their head hits that pillow and they have sweet sweet dreams they dream of a game where they're able to give Bijan robinson 25 carries able to give tyler algier 20 carries Maybe have some read, I don't know, maybe get Desmond Ritter another 10 carries and have Desmond Ritter throw the ball five total times, all right? Super weird game. We're not going to see this environment very often for the Atlanta Falcons. And the other side note is with Drake London, he did go up against Washington. Keep in mind, this is the same defense that allows every wide receiver to dominate. So whatever wide receiver plays Washington next week, that will be a player that we start. Kyle Pitts gets there for us. You'll know I drafted Kyle Pitts in a considerable amount of underdog drafts this offseason. But honestly, kind of lucky for it to happen, right? Ritter, 47 pass attempts. Kyle Pitts only had six targets. Very frustrating. Um, John R. Smith had himself five targets. If you take John R. Smith and Kyle Pitts stat line, if you combine those two together, oh, Kyle Pitts is a league winner, baby. But I mean, if you're operating in a tight end by committee in Atlanta, we're not excited. Now, going over to Seattle, I mean, Geno Smith did not play well, right? 41 pass attempts, zero touchdowns, two interceptions. Kenneth Walker got there. Kenneth Walker got there with the rushing touchdown, not super efficient. If you're looking at the running back usage, Walker did see 56 snaps compared to Zach Charbonnet at 17. This is important to point out because the Seattle Seahawks were trailing this game pretty much the entire time. And the other thing that I want to point out when it comes to the usage here with the receivers, that is, is you actually have Jackson Smith and Jigba, a buy low candidate for us this past week, showing the improvement in his overall snaps. 
Now this graph's from PFF. All the snap data will be from PFF, ladies and gentlemen. Now, of course, these snaps don't necessarily lead to a ton of fantasy points for JSN. JSN, five targets, comparison to Lockett at eight, comparison to DK Metcalf at 10. And if you are looking at the underlying snap data, I mean, it really does go to show that JSN is really just going to be in there at three wide receiver sets. But in those three wide receiver sets, if he can get be a little bit more efficient, we'll be excited. Now, going to the Cincinnati side of things, uh, not too much to discuss. Joe Mixon dominates usage. Joe Mixon, 38 snaps out of a potential 54. You have T. Higgins, as someone we were saying was unstartable because the rib injury, plus we had the burrow injury. But with that being said, mark it on your calendar. We said it this week, after this week, now you have a very interesting buy low moment on T. Higgins. They're going into the bye week seven, coming out of the bye in week eight. Hopefully, Joe Burrow will be 100% healthy at that time. Burrow played well today. Hopefully, T. Higgins will be 100% healthy at that time. And T. Higgins can vault up to being that high-end wide receiver two in fantasy that you drafted him to be. So not too many takeaways in Cincinnati. I do just want to remind you, look to buy low on Higgins. Now, going over to Indianapolis, super weird game. Gardner Minshew, three interceptions, 55 pass attempts. So a lot of these passing volume stats are going to be a little bit skewed, right? I'm going to get 14 passing attempts for Michael Pittman. 14 attempts looks great, but then you divide 14 by 55 and you realize, oh, that's a 25% team target share. If these attempts come back down to like 35, that's more like eight attempts. I mean, eight targets per game. But nonetheless, Michael Pittman Jr. did well with those targets. We love it for our best ball teams. The main thing everybody here is looking for will be the usage when it comes to the running backs. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I thought it would be a 60-40 split in favor of Jonathan Taylor. It looked more like a 55-45 split in favor of Zach Moss. Zach Moss, 39 snaps comparison to Jonathan Taylor at 33. Trey Sermon got some involvement. The game was a blowout. Don't care. Now, both running backs got there. Zag Moss gets there with the rushing touchdown. Jonathan Taylor gets there with five receptions for 46 receiving yards. Had both players ranked as low-end RB2s coming into the week, I had Jonathan Taylor ranked slightly ahead of Zag Moss. Now, going into this next week, what my initial thoughts on this will be, okay, I'm going to expect that Jonathan Taylor, the guy they paid $42 million to, continues to increase his role like we just saw. And honestly, I'll probably move Jonathan Taylor to being a mid-RB2. Zach Moss still have to rank him as that low-end RB2 just because this usage that we are seeing. But still, I think as the season goes on, we're going to get more and more Taylor, which is what this trend is showing. Now, going over to Jacksonville, I mean, they look good. But Travis Etienne, our guy, two rushing touchdowns. You love to see it. I was hoping it was going to be a way bigger day, to be honest with you. I mean, I was ready to go out there and run victory laps in the first quarter. And then I was sitting here going, oh, you know what, man? Let's sit here. Let's wait till this man has three touchdowns. Let's sit here and let's wait till Travis Etienne has 150 yards. Um, no, Etienne inefficient, 3.1 yards per carry, only 55 rushing yards, but the offense is good. Etienne gets the involvement as a receiver. He has his three receptions, 28 receiving yards beautiful a beautiful 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 in a ppr format significantly erases his floor as well as his ceiling which is what we've seen all season gets you the two rushing yards and continues to dominate snaps 51 out of 64 snaps in this offense going over the receivers not too much to discuss i mean it's all funneled through kurt ingram and ridley it's really who scores the touchdown right ridley led the team in targets at eight Evan Ingram followed him at seven. Christian Kirk followed them at six. But Christian Kirk was the guy who scored the touchdown this week. So Kirk was the guy that you wanted in your lineup. Now going over to our next game, we're going to be looking at the Carolina offense. And the one thing that I need to just go out there and make an apology about is I believe we have Adam Thielen ranked as a mid to low end wide receiver two this past week. And y'all initially called me out for my BS. Y'all went straight to the comment section and went, this guy Mason's a straight up clown. Adam Thielen's a wide receiver one. I was going, okay, he's been a wide receiver one. He, uh, going into this week, he was the wide receiver 10 from points per game perspective. Don't know what he is now. I was like, okay, you may see this offense fall back. The spread on this game's 14 points, yada, yada, yada. No, the DJ Chark usage actually goes down. Chark only plays 46 snaps in this offense. Jonathan Mingo gets up to 63. Mingo may be a sneaky waiver wire ad that we'll talk about tomorrow. But Adam Thielen dominates targets. He has 13 targets. Chew Bubbard must start running back in any game that you have. No Miles Sanders. Chew Bubbard plays 53 snaps out of 68. He sees 19 carries. 
And what's a little bit surprising is, I mean, we've seen him in the past, even with Miles Sanders playing, have a larger role as a receiver where you only had one reception of the backfield, but it is what it is. We know to start him when you have no Sanders. Going over to Miami, the rule of thumb is you start as many Miami Dolphins as you possibly can. If they play in South Beach, they play in your fantasy lineup. You have Raheem Mostert, two rushing touchdowns, crushing in a beautiful matchup in an elite offense. He also gives you the receiving touchdown. I wish I drafted more Raheem Mostert. What else am I supposed to say? Going over to Tyreek. Tyreek crushes. No surprise to anybody. Jalen Waddle crushes. One of our buy low candidates last week. Y'all know we had a couple more that we had on. But nonetheless, if they're in Miami, you start them. And there's nothing else to discuss. I mean, Ahmed does go out there. And Ahmed is the clear RB2. But we don't know how this is going to look when Jeff Wilson Jr. comes in. And then Tyreek Hill did lead this game with cramps. Looks like Tyreek Hill is going to be fine, though. No concerns. Going over to Minnesota. I know that, I mean, there are a couple of different ways we can go about this. First thing is I want to be looking at the usage because that's the most important thing, right? Very similar to Jackson Smith and Jigba. No duh. We're going to see these rookie wide receivers get more and more involved as the season goes on. Jordan Addison, straight linear lineup. Like I said, this graphs from PFF with his snaps. And then Alexander Madison. We are very worried over the past few weeks that Cam Akers is going to come in and Cam Akers is going to have some large role. Uh, and he did last week, this week. Nope. Cam Akers is a non-factor. Cam Akers played nine snaps compared to Sin Madison at 45. So yeah, we had Madison as a player that we are for sure benching. But honestly, now I'd say, well, you know what? Maybe Madison's even a little bit more appealing. Hawkinson's going to crush. He had eight targets. Cousins did not look good with no Jefferson, which was expectation. Going over to Chicago. Yeah, Justin Fields getting injured. And I know we had people on Twitter screaming, oh, see, it's not Justin Fields' fault. Look at how bad our undrafted free agent quarterback is as well. Okay, come on. We were going through saying to sell more, sell Justin Fields. Justin Fields right now dealing with the thumb injury. We don't know the extent of this. I don't know what the timeline's going to be. Nonetheless, Justin Fields had 58 passing, passing yards off of 10 attempts and an interception before he went down with four sacks. He kind of got there with the rushing yardage, but nonetheless in Chicago, DJ Moore falls back down to earth just a bit. You can blame this on the quarterback play. I don't think that they're going to have great quarterback play going forward regardless. So, yeah, I know I, I don't want to run victory lap saying, oh, I told you to sell Justin Fields and DJ Moore. Of, of course, I'm an idiot if I try to say that. Now, going over to New Orleans, Alave looked good. I mean, he went out there, seven receptions, 96 receiving yards, 10 targets. Shahid was the guy that got going at the beginning of the game. So that was making me a little bit nervous. But nonetheless, Alave looks like that player that we were going through and saying to start every week. Kind of benefit from the Derek Carr 50 passing attempts, so I'm not going to lie. And then with Alvin Kamara, he goes out there, ton of usage, right? Kamara, 66 snaps, comparison to Conjure Miller at 18. If you're looking at Miller, I mean, really no concerns at all for the usage of Kamara at this point. He had two carries. He had one reception. Kamara is the guy specifically in full BBR formats where he had Kamara at seven. Now, going over to Houston, CJ Stroud, I mean, looks good, right? I mean, two passing touchdowns. I was excited to take his 2x multiplier on underdog for the touchdown. Sadly, he did not get there, but he does get there with 80 receiving yards and the four receptions. The main thing that I want to be looking at is the running back usage, where you had Devin Singletary with 34 snaps, Damian Pierce with 21, and Mike Boone with 10. So sadly, we thought that Damian Pierce was expanding his role. Now that just gets shrunk. Devin Singletary is the lead back here. And yet no running back in Houston will be startable for the time being. I think you can roster Singletary. You can roster Damian Pierce. But if it's a three-man running back by committee, you can't look at anybody. Now going over to the Detroit game. There are a couple different things we need to be looking at. David Montgomery leaves the game, does not come back. X-rays come back negative. We don't know what the timeline looks like as of now. Craig Reynolds steps in as the starting running back and he steps in, does really nothing. I mean, super inefficient with his overall workload. The story of the game is Amon Ross St. Brown, our by the glow candidate last week, 15 targets, 12 receptions, 124 receiving yards and the receiving touchdown. Super excited to see it. He dominates with targets. Laporta dominates with targets as well. Got to give a shout out to Laporta with 11 targets. Fantasy day wasn't necessarily there. You continue to get this kind of target volume. It will be though. And then going over to Jamison Williams with Jamison. He got there for us in best ball, but going forward in reality, I still don't necessarily think that this is someone that we can be confident in starting. 
The reason being is if you're going to look at what you have with Jamison Williams, he's more so that field stretching wide receiver that is going to be helping out players underneath like Sam Laporta and Amon Ross St. Brown generate space where he's going to help the Lions offense a ton. Occasionally have that long touchdown, which is why we drafted him in best ball and your regular draft. I don't necessarily think he's too exciting though. Going over to Tampa, Rashad White looks like he is no longer a must start running back off of volume. Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, both just funnel everything in this offense. You have Godwin, seven targets, leads the team in the receiving. Mike Evans at 10. And no running back is startable at this point in Tampa if it's a running back by committee. Going over to New England, Ramadre Stevenson finally gets you something with a rushing touchdown. You would hope that it maybe would be a little bit better because they have two rushing touchdowns. But Ezekiel Elliott, of course, has one here. You have a ton of receiving volume going to Kendrick Bourne. You had no Juju Smith-Schuster in this game. Doesn't really matter. Juju's going to do nothing anyway. We'll talk about Kendrick Bourne a little bit more in our waiver wire video. In reality, I don't necessarily think that anybody here in New England's intriguing. The only thing is you start Ramadre is that mid to low end RB2 based off his receiving usage. I mean, he did have six targets in this game. Going over to Vegas, Jimmy Garoppolo went down. You had Brian Hoyer coming in, and it would have potentially been an even bigger game for Jacoby Myers. Myers started off super hot. He's the guy with the receiving touchdown. He had seven targets, 61 receiving yards, and five receptions. Devontae Adams kind of falls back here. I, you don't know if it's this because the shoulder injury for Devontae Adams. You don't know if it's the quarterback play. You don't know if he's not in it. You don't know if, I mean, he's just old now. I don't know what's going on with Devontae Adams. I'm going to be starting him this next week. When it comes to Myers, you probably can't start him if Jimmy Garoppolo does not play. And it's not looking good for Jimmy G right now. May end up being that Adams and Jacobs are the only guys that are going to be good to go in this offense. Even though Myers is out there crushing so far. I'm just not super confident in the offense with no Jimmy G. Going over to Arizona, they look horrendous. I mean, Hollywood Brown does end up getting 11 targets. He has the volume, but the issue is when the offense is this bad, doesn't matter how much volume you get, it's not going to happen for you. And then going over to what we have with the running backs, Demercado was the waiver wire pickup everybody was looking at this week. I said he definitely needed to be someone that we rostered. Keontae Ingram as well needed to be someone that we rostered, but we couldn't start any Arizona running back until we were figuring out who the guy was. And out of left field, Damian, Her Damian Williams comes out and Damian Williams has a role here. So it's frustrating, but you have a three-man running back by committee where nobody is viable in Arizona. Hollywood is still startable as that low-end wide receiver too. Zach Ertz kind of falls back. Trey McBride ends up seeing five targets here as well. Now going over to the Rams, Kyron Williams, Kyron Williams, Kyron Williams is him. 158 rushing yards. Adds on the rushing touchdown. Surprising to see him not really get involved too much, specifically as a receiver, but ultimately it doesn't matter, right? You get there with the rushing touchdown, the 158 yards. You do you. Cup has nine targets. Puka has seven. And y'all know I spent the beginning portion of this season saying sell Puka high, go get Chris Olave, go get Jalen Waddle. When Cup comes back in, Puka's going to be a low end wide receiver too in fantasy. I would like to say, ha, 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 I told y'all I'm not stupid. In reality, I am stupid. Puka could have had a big game here. Puka dropped a touchdown in the red zone. So, I mean, while it looks tough, the four receptions, 26 receiving yards, if instead this would have been five receptions for 45 receiving yards and the receiving touchdown, would have been a completely different story for Puka. He still did have seven targets. I think that Puka still will be that high-end wide receiver too going forward. If you wanted to take a Lave or Waddle like I would have, I'd be fine with that, but I still want to emphasize Puka is startable going forward. Please do not panic on Puka. Now going over to Philadelphia, Jalen Hurts has the rushing touchdown. Outside of that, they can't really get it going rushing. You have DeAndre Swift with 18 yards. You had Kenneth Gainwell with 13. Swift saves his day with eight receptions off of 10 targets with 40 receiving yards. And looked great with the receiving touchdown. At the time it happened, I did not think he was going to be able to hold on to it. He had to go behind his body, bring it back in, go through contact. It was an incredible catch. But outside of that, not too much to discuss with the receivers. A.J. Brown crushes. 
Seven receptions, 131 receiving yards. Devonta Smith was a buy low guy for us this past week. He has a fine game. By no means is it great, right? He has 11 targets, five receptions, 44 receiving yards. But honestly, I stand by. I think we were to go out there and buy this guy. If he's in an elite level offense, getting 11 freaking targets, Smith will be much better. Just got to give him some time. And then going over to the Zach Wilson-led New York Jets, what's interesting is you had Rodgers warming up over there before the game. So that will be something to at least keep your eye on. It will keep the Jets motivated to stay in contention. Brees Hall was a must-start running back for us just based off usage, based off the receiving role, and at the same time, the red zone role. He has the rushing touchdown, even in a very tough matchup. He has five receptions, 455 receiving yards as well, so looks great. Garrett Wilson is being funneled everything in this offense. You had 144 receiving yards going between Garrett Wilson and Brees Hall, and then only 186 total passing yards on this team. So nothing really changes in New York. Brees Hall remains a must-start running back, and Garrett Wilson remains a wide receiver too. He overcomes the tough matchup against the Philadelphia Eagles. Zach Wilson, still not a great quarterback. Now, I think that's all we have for this recap. So if you haven't done so already, go down there, drop a like, subscribe to the channel if you play fantasy football. And I remind you, please make sure you take advantage of this. Literally can't believe you even have it. Justin Herbert, more than less than half a total yard for Monday night's game with promo good flock. And if you're new to underdog fantasy on top of that, Dak Prescott, more than less than half a passing yard with promo good flock. And if you're new, a 100% deposit match with promo good flock. Our 2023 rest of season rankings and tiers with promo good flock. Make sure you take advantage of it. Could not be happier that we were able to get y'all all of that really only for today. But thank you again. I really do appreciate you. Really hope you have a great day and really hope we get to see you out in the live stream tomorrow night.